Welcome to the Healthy Skin Show with Jennifer Fugo, where we're flipping everything you've been told about your chronic skin issues upside down and connecting you with alternative solutions your dermatologist never told you about. Welcome back to episode number 293 of the Healthy Skin Show. In today's episode, we are going to dive into a really important topic Actually, we're headed back into the oral microbiome health section. We've talked a few times with other dentists on the show about oral health, but this particular conversation really, truly stands out. And this information is something that impacts not just potentially your skin, because we're going to be talking about one very specific type of bacteria that is wreaking havoc and creating such serious inflammatory issues that we can see the problems not only in various chronic skin problems, but also in chronic health problems. My guest today is a really interesting and brilliant dentist. His name is Dr. Mark Cannon, and we met at a conference where he presented some of this information, and I thought it was so incredibly powerful that I would bring this to the show to share with you. Dr. Cannon is a professor of otolaryngology, Division of Dentistry at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine, an attending physician at Anne and Robert Lurie's Children's Hospital and a member of the International Association of Pediatric Dentistry. In addition to being the founder of Associated Dental Specialists of Long Grove, he is the research coordinator of the Pediatric Dental Residency Program at Anne and Robert Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago. Dr. Cannon has over 40 years of experience in pediatric dental dentistry and has presented lectures both nationally and internationally. And he lectures on many oral health topics, including evolutionary oral medicine, the gateway microbiomes, biologic and bioactive dental materials, probiotics, and all aspects of everyday pediatric oral health. So without further ado, let's dive into today's conversation. Dr. Cannon, thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you for having me. This is truly an honor and a pleasure. Well, the way that we met was at the Integrative Dermatology Symposium 2022, and you had given a fantastic talk to all of these physicians and other practitioners in attendance about the connection of the microbiome in the mouth and what can happen in other areas of the body, including the skin. And I just thought it was such a fascinating conversation because I was I am somewhat familiar with the oral microbiome causing problems systemically. And we've t- we've had a couple conversations um, about this on the Healthy Skin Show, but you came at this from a completely different angle that I had never heard of before. And I thought it was so worthwhile to have this conversation because I think that my listeners would love to know this. So you talked about this whole concept of sort of gateway microbiomes and that the mouth is a gateway microbiome. So can you explain to listeners like what what is this gateway microbiome that you speak of? Well, we have barrier microbiomes, like the skin is a barrier. But the oral cavity, the mouth, that's where everything goes in. Fluid, food, people breathe through their mouth, which they shouldn't. But they have all these things that go in. And so the microbiome, the bacteria, the mouth have to be extra developed as a defensive microbiome and also to process nutrients. One of the things we didn't talk about is that there's a genus, a big group of bacteria called Rothia, they break down gluten. As you chew anything that has gluten, it breaks it down. And people who are gluten sensitive are missing their rothia. And if you have, that's why they've done these great studies showing, you know, the first degree relatives. They'll show a young lady who is in these studies who cannot eat any bread, they're gluten sensitive, but the brother drinks pizza, you know, drinks beer and eats pizza, no problem at all because they have gluten metabolizers. That research was done first at Harvard and Foresight in about 2013. And they actually went ahead and they uh, copyrighted the use of those bacteria to treat celiac disease. But for some odd reason, 
it hasn't gone anywhere, mainly because you cannot really patent those bacteria. They found 150 strains, and then the very next year, my research group, we found 16 more strains, including one that was a super gluten metabolizer that would break down over a half of all your gluten in your mouth, and a lot of it's broken down as you swallow it, and then the bolus, the chunk of food and saliva. By the time it gets to your stomach, the gluten's gone. It's been digested by the bacteria. And that's been going on for thousands and thousands of years, ever since we started the Neolithic period 12,000 years ago. And we started to eat grains. Those grains were covered with bacteria that actually break down those grains. And when we stopped utilizing stone, like stone mills or brass rollers, we created so many illnesses. But let's go back to the gateways. Okay, because I digress easily, as you notice. <laughs> this episode is brought to you by my skincare line, Dermaquel. The beauty of these skincare products are that they are especially crafted for those struggling with chronic skin rash issues based on my research and clinical experience from my private practice. They focus on organic ingredients that are clean like zinc, aloe, and hemp oil that support and calm rashed, dry, angry skin. There's no unnecessary chemicals or additives that can further dry out your skin or mess with your hormones. And I'm so excited for you to add these creams into your routine. Check them out at quellshop.com and use the coupon code GET15OFF to get 15% off your first order. I'll put a link in the description below. And now let's jump back to the video. Well, I'm but. sure you have a lot of great knowledge of things that you have been exposed to that um, I'm sure we can dive into in another episode. But yeah, oh, yeah, I mean, this this gateway microbiome concept that you shared was just fascinating and especially a, about uh, that one bacteria. You can yeah, say it. I'm going to I'm going to butcher it. Yeah, yeah it's OK. Uh, I'm, I'm really bad at remembering people's names, but I remember bacteria very well. <laughs> Uh, there's a little humor in that. But um, yeah, so we have gateways with the nasal gateway microbiome and we have the oral gateway microbiome. And then there's a third important one, which is the placental microbiome, which is also a gateway microbiome. The placenta is supposed to have a lot of bacteria. It's called maternal imprinting. And that goes back to, I think it was 2004, or 2007 was another major one article in the Journal of Pediatrics about how the, in a mother, the white blood cells called monocytes pick up bacteria, keeps those bacteria alive throughout the blood, takes it over to the breast so can, those bacteria can be excreted in the breast milk. And we now know that there are thousands of strains of bacteria in breast milk. It's very low wow. because that, again, is a form of a gateway going into the mouth. You got implant the right bacteria in the mouth. So nasal microbiome, we just finished, um, not even a year ago, probably six months ago now, doing the deep sequencing whole genome. We went deep, found over 2,500 interesting species and strains that a lot of them are involved with health. But let's don't talk about that. Let's go on to the oral microbiome. Because that gateway microbiome you use all the time, every time you swallow. You know, you swallow a thousand times a day. You swallow a hundred billion bacteria a day. A hundred billion bacteria a day. And people talk about taking that probiotic of theirs, which has two billion CFUs. But you swallow a hundred billion CFUs a day, colony farming units. And if you have the wrong guys here, your gut gets messed up. Now, the Human Microbiome Project proved that, and we talked about that that lecture, that over half the, well, half the population has their gut controlled by the mouth. And so if you have leaky gut, which makes our new axis of disease, you have you know, leaky gums, leaky gut, leaky blood-brain barrier, and before you know it, you know, problems with the skin, which is what um, we've shown in so many studies and published, you'll find a lot of studies showing that with every skin disorder, there's an associated gut microbiome problem. 
you know, atopic dermatitis, or it's just one last month published in Journal Immunology, where they looked at mother-child pairs, dyads, so look at the mom and the, and the kid, and the, it was a long-term study, longitudinal, they wasn't going back retrospectively, they went, started off looking at the microbiomes and checked for which microbiomes were related with what disease. And they found that a specific microbiome from the mother, which is given to the child, was associated with allergies, asthma, ectopic dermatitis, eczema. So we have all those skin issues, which are because something went wrong in the gateway. And a gateway microbiome, in the oral microbiome, we have, which I have often lecture about, there was these bacteria that are very, very important. And they break down the nitrates. Those are things you find in all your green leafy vegetables. If you're missing the bacteria, guess of the mouth. If you're missing those bacteria in the mouth, this is what happens to you. Cavities, gum disease, higher blood pressure, more likely to have a cardiovascular event, more likely to have higher BMI, more likely to get diabetes, and more likely to get cancer. Wow. I know. Wow. So always there's the good guys you're missing, whether it's the rothia I mentioned before for breaking down your gluten. But if you don't have the nitrate-reducing bacteria, you know what? They've actually shown in studies, which surprises a lot of people, if you don't have those bacteria, you don't get much of a benefit from working out. Really? Yeah, they do mouth rinses that kill the bacteria, then you have to work out, and they check the benefit it has in the effect on your blood pressure from working out, and you lose those benefits because you can't form new capillaries without having the nitrites in your system. Nitric oxide was the reason why three people got the Nobel Prize in 1998. It's on the American Heart Association recommendations that you keep your oral nitrate reducing bacteria but right now right now you can go to any drugstore buy a mouthwash i'll kill your good guys so that is tragic and we often say don't use those mouthwashes they'll kill the good guys you want to get rid of the bad guys well sadly most of the bad bacteria the pathogens uh like you were mentioning Porphyromonas gingivalis, which is a keystone pathogen related. There's another one called Fusobacterium nucleatum fat A. These guys, they're related to cardiovascular disease very strongly. In fact, you can take a bunch of mice and give them a little you know, rinses, they inoculate the mouth with Porphyromonas gingivalis. And you'll see them start to get gum disease and cardiovascular disease, whereas if you use the sterile saline in other groups, they don't get that. They end up getting atherosclerosis because Porphyromonas gingivalis creates atherosclerosis. So the mouth bacteria, that's that's what we're talking about here. The mouth bacteria is a cause, what is it? Would you say it's a causative factor in developing? Oh, yes. the, yeah, in wow. Alzheimer's too, inflammatory Alzheimer's. Again, they have great studies showing in humans, famous ones by Steve and Domini and others, where they look at brain samples, histological sessions of the brain. They'll find the Porphyromonas gingivalis in there because as people call it PG, so we'll call it PG and make it easier for everybody. Um, it is a strange bug that started to evolve with us about 40,000 years ago as best we can guess, um, came to us from dogs. Uh, we returned the favor, sadly. That's why dogs have terrible gum disease and cats now. We returned the favor to our pets. Um, it is one that is capable of being a gorilla. It subverts your immune system. It goes inside your cell. So like epithelial cells, like on the skin, you're going to have your keratinocytes and all that, right? What it does is it goes inside the cell. Now, once it gets inside the cell, 
it forms these little pockets called vesicles or phagolysosomes is the correct term and they propagate in that and they become quiescent they they lose what is called quorum sensing they don't become aggressive they become parasites and the term is a pathobiont they live in your cell they turn off your normal cell system of death called apoptosis they make the cell go into a sleep state called senescence and they just propagate and grow your, your cells of your body become a breeding plant for this pathogen now if something comes along and disturbs it and causes a bacteremia is those bacteria in the blood they do the same thing inside your endothelial cells but they break down all your barriers they can make these junctions between your cells like your epithelial cells break apart so other things to get in so you get a lot more inflammation in general um, yeah it's a controlling keystone pathogen recognized now by the NIH National Institutes of Health and there is now a big race to try to develop a vaccine against it which is stupid <laughs> Okay. I'm, I'm gonna bite yes why why is it stupid it's a evolute it's evolving and we have six strains but I think if we go back far enough we'll find there is only three strains and the more recent ev evolved ones are even more clever at evading our immune system um, we can get rid of it by using a lot of good supplements there's a lot of good probiotics that inhibit it there's a lot available right now you can walk into anywhere and buy some good probiotics that greatly inhibit PG and the other one FN there's prebiotics readily available uh, all the xylitol based products xylitol greatly inhibits it it prevents it from adhering and penetrating into the cell so it can't get into the cell and prevents it so would would you look for xylitol in like a toothpaste or oh, a yeah. chewing gum? Because that's usually where I've seen it. Yeah, in, in the chewing gum studies, I mean, the chewing gum studies are famous. Um, there is one by Solderling and another one by Isocangus. But they, um, I always quote the people because they deserve the credit for the work they did. I mean, otherwise it's not genuine. But they uh, did one again with mother-child pairs where the mom chewed the xylitol chewing gum from six months of age of the child to two years of age of the child and it prevented the transmission of the bad bacteria to the child from the mom in over wow. 80 percent and then five years later those kids ended up having 71 to 73 percent fewer cavities five years later so I always tell the moms when you know I'm retired clinically but in my practice, I would always tell the moms who were like expecting and planning another child, I said, get yourself started on xylitol gum. But here's another big benefit. Because porphyrmonas gingivalis is associated strongly with preeclampsia. And you know, you can actually transmit preeclampsia from a woman with high blood pressure who is preeclamptic to a mouse that is has a, a, a pregnant mouse. That mouse will get uh, preeclampsia. Wow. From, it's Yeah, because it's, it's controlled by the bacteria of the gut. And if you have uh, those uh, porphyrmonas gingivalis has gotten into the small intestine and all that, gets in the bloodstream, it causes, in fact, you find it in the umbilical cord whenever there is uh, preeclampsia. But a fused bacterial nucleatum actually causes uh, miscarriages and, and has been documented because stillbirth and preterm birth. So there's a great study done by Dr. Kirsty Argard out of Baylor uh, with about, I think, 9,000, 10,000 women altogether uh, over a long period of time. And it was a multi-center study, a very, very powerful multi-center study. And they significantly reduced preterm birth by having the moms to xylitol gum. I mean, the savings wow. in healthcare dollars are huge. But see it again, you're working on a gateway microbiome and you're inhibiting a keystone pathogen actually two of them you're inhibiting two keystone pathogens we could do that right now and in fact it's common in some countries like japan a lot of times they do that in south korea also 
Um, can I ask, because I think people are going to wonder, like, how? I know you said that this is a, at least the PG, so mm-hmm. Porphyromonas gingivalis. Yes. I think I, gingivalis, I think I got it somewhat correct this time. Um, so it, I know that it's something that you said came from dogs originally, but like, may have. Yeah. May have. Um, so how do we end up with it now? Is it from, I know you said the mouthwash, the use of mouthwash, which I will be honest, my dentist still makes me use mouthwash every time I go to the dentist, which I find annoying. Um, but is it also partly due to the environment or drug use, like prescription drugs or with the dogs? It was a sharing of DNA. You know how they have these little DNA plasmids, bacteria you can share back and forth, like for antibiotic resistance. So it appears, and this is theory, no proof at all. I mean, it could be a nutty, nutty theory too. Um, that uh, they have a form of bacteria called Porphyromonas gallae that has these three little genetic modifications. We now have. Porphyromonas gingivalis with these six modifications. I think that a couple of those came from dogs because when we started doing hunting with dogs, proto dogs, they were called, and it's a type of wolf that is a stink. A stink. It's no longer around. Um, they we shared food and we shared microbiomes, and whenever you do that, you always have zoonotic diseases. I mean, look at the classic is tuberculosis. It went from cattle to human, then from human back to cattle again. And so, I mean, we're having zoonotic diseases forever, whether yeah. it's swine flu, bird flu. <laughs> sure. Uh. And do you think that the antibiotic use potentially, I mean, I know when I was a kid and I'm in my 40s now, I mean, my dad was a doctor. I got oh, a lot of 29. antibiotics. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you. But <laughs> I did get a lot of antibiotics, which has unfortunately yeah. had a pretty big impact on my, my gut microbiome. Oh, Do you yeah. think that that can also, the use of antibiotics can impact this P. gingivalis and its ability to no, thrive? This, this guy was going nuts on us way, way back, thousands of years ago. In fact, there's mummies who have a, extreme periodontal disease. In fact, when the most classic things you ever see is a mummy that had a, a special bridge made from here. I'm, I'm, I mean, this is an ancient Egyptian, like from 4,000 years ago, had a fake teeth placed uh, using gold wire, and they made a little fake bridge on the bottom. And, and it was donor teeth, so the teeth came from someone else. <laughs> oh, my. Probably not a volunteer. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> oh, my. Oh my goodness! Because the gum but, disease um, was so rampant. Okay. Going back, uh, back to the even before, it was when we were hunter gatherers we started to get really bad gum disease. So um, that okay. that predates a lot of things. Now cavities, much worse now than ever before. I mean, it skyrocketed. Like the most common reason for a child to have outpatient surgery in the United Kingdom is dental surgery. Oh, that sounds awful. We have I don't like it. having dental surgery now as an adult. I can't. Ugh. These little poor little three, yeah. four, five year olds are coming in with everything going on. Abscesses. Shutting down for COVID was a dual edged sword. Everyone will tell you that. With the fact they had on oncology patients, cardiology mm-hmm. patients, kids, kids learning, everything. It had a huge negative effect too. And we yeah. saw so much more disease. Um, when people started to come back, it was pretty rampant. A part of it was just eating nonstop. You had the refrigerator right there and kids weren't going to school. I mean, it's, it's, the lack of activity definitely did not help. And and speaking of kids, strep tends to be a problem in kids. And I have noticed a really interesting correlation between some of my clients who struggle with psoriasis and that it oh, was triggered or would worsen from a strep infection. Do you have do you have any thoughts about that? I know that you had mentioned strep in your presentation, but is it a strep infection of the mouth that's a strep? I mean, obviously we do get strep infections in the mouth. So talk to us a little bit about that. Well, the bacteria involved, strep pyogenes, um, that bacteria is actually strongly inhibited by a good bacteria, strep salivarius. So that work was done decades ago by Dr. Stan Schulman at my children's hospital. I'm, 
I'm a full professor at the Feinberg School of Medicine and at uh, Anna Rubber H. Laurie Children's Hospital. And he was a great guy, a brilliant person to work with. And he discovered that, again, diseases because they're lacking the good guys. And so there are strep salivarius uh, probiotics you can take. And I routinely did that for my patients who had strep throat or ear infections because it not only inhibited the occurrence of ear infections and sinus infections and strep throat, it also at the same time reduced the cavity rate because strep salivarius would kill the strep mutans that causes cavities. You know, wow. They compete. They compete all the time. When you hear people say that your microbiome is an ongoing battlefield, it is an ongoing battlefield. What you need to do is give your good guys allies, which are the probiotics, the good bacteria, you need to give them the weapons they need, which are the prebiotics. And please do me a favor, everybody out there, don't think as prebiotics as fibers, please, anymore. Prebiotics are anything that helps a good bacteria. Think about prebiotics for your skin. Are you going to put fiber on your skin? No. No, but a prebiotic for your skin could be an essential oil that inhibits Pseudomonas aeruginosa, that would inhibit uh, Staph uh, epidermidis, not Staph, uh, Staph aureus, rather. But there's a good essential oils, as you know, they've done a lot of studies with essential oils in the skin microbiome. So, yeah, you use a skin product. Coconut oil, one of my absolute favorites is coconut oil. And it is so good in so many ways, and it's antifungal, which is very important because candida albicans, all the candida assemblages, where it forms a supraorganism by connecting with certain bacteria, those are so pathogenic. They're so disease causing, and they're oncogenic, they're cancer causing. In fact, the assemblages between bacteria and certain fungals have just recently, in the last few months, I think it was about six months ago, was shown in the oncology journals to be associated with over 35 different cancer cell line developments. Wow. Wow. Now at Northwestern, we're working with prebiotics right now in, in our studies with, um, these are preclinical trials with humanized mice that we're working to inhibit uh, two very deadly cancer cell lines and we're having success. So it's very important people realize that prebiotics is anything that benefits the good bacteria. Yeah. yeah. Can I also ask, and this is just a question that popped into my head as you were talking. I've had some clients, again, psoriasis clients, who've really mm -hmm. struggled with tonsil stones. Is yeah. there any connection with the microbiome and tonsil stones? You know, I think you asked me that question before. I, I, I found some articles about different strep strains and tonsillates, which we, I, I think we've known about that for a long time. But again, I'm not sure, you know, the, the connection between psoriasis and um, strep pyogenes has been well established now. Yeah. But I think it was probably questioned for years. Um, but there's been enough uh, meta-analysis, large studies done that they have shown the connection. And of course, I'm a psoriasis sufferer, so yeah, I, yeah. Because you know, you know what I do for mine, I know I, I think I mentioned to you before, I have this little miracle thing that helps me so much with skin. Can please, I tell you? please, you can, you can share. <laughs> okay. African black soap. And that's just but, what you use to wash in the shower? Mm-hmm, African black soap. Are you, are you familiar with African black I, soap? I actually am. Okay, good. I figure you probably were very familiar with it, but um, I, I'm I'm a rather recent convert, and I got converted because I was at a typical Chicago festival several years ago. I walked past a booth. I always look at different soaps because of my skin issues, and uh, there was this nice big display of African black soap. I was immediately intrigued. Because whenever you make something outside, and I, in my lectures I show how they make the soap outside, you get the good bacteria. 
You get all those soil organisms you need. You get the bacillus and tell us. You get all the good soil organisms. So that's what your skin needs. You're so much healthier outside. Yeah. Right. That is that is very true. There's a lot of truth to that. And we've had e experts on the show who have attested to that. And even the detrimental impact from the pandemic of people being locked indoors and how that drastically um, and negatively impacted their disease severity of whatever condition they had. So it's just sort of like interesting that we have that data, but in a sense, kind of sad that we have it now because of what happened to people in real life, in real time. Um, but it was, it was predictable. Yes. It was predictable yes, it was. because we know what's good for us. We know that being outside, we know that uh, having, being exposed just to regular elements actually makes your skin better because what makes you better is defense. You know, your body is always trying to repair and to reestablish itself. And so when you are little constant challenges, um, keep you, that keeps you sharper mentally. Working out every day makes you sharper too, right? Oh, yep. we know that. That was predictable. Putting people in with processed food in a closed environment, I mean, who could not predict safely right. that we were going to have a problem exactly <laughs> exactly and and so i definitely want to make sure too that people can get in touch with you um because i know that you're retired now from clinical practice but you are available on linkedin which will link to your profile but also you had shared with me beforehand that you are the president of the american academy of oral and systemic health and so people could connect with you there at the aaosh.org. This is predominantly for doctors and other medical practitioners. And it sounds like practitioners even potentially who are more on the functional and alternative oh, side as many, well. Many, many functional, alternative, integrative. We have many like nurse practitioners coming in, uh, nutritionists. So yeah, we're just uh, integrative health. And it's the American Academy for Oral and Systemic Health. It's AOSH. I'm the president-elect, and, and I have a big job in front of me next year. They, they've already said we want to have 10 times the members. So everyone out there, be sure to sign up tomorrow. Awesome. <laughs> well, and you have this fireside chat, which is a part of that. So if people are interested in learning more, and it looks like you also get CE credits, which are important for folks who are you know, obviously licensed in their state and they need those CEs to keep their licensure, that can be really helpful. So I think it's a great opportunity for people to expand what their um, what their knowledge base is and connect with other like-minded practitioners. And I just, I like I said, I loved your talk at IDS. Oh, so I found it to be really informative. Um, and I think it's fascinating when we can connect so many different dots and remember that the body is a whole unit. It's this whole beautiful it is a whole like, unit. universe or orchestrated universe in one, one, it's one thing and in not these little tiny pieces cut up, you know, as we oftentimes see in conventional medicine. And so thank you so much for sharing this with us. And I hope I can have you come back sometime and dive I'd into some to. other research that you, you are clearly digging into, which is so cool. Okay, well, thank you so much. I'm so appreciative that Dr. Cannon was willing to come and share about this particular organism, the P. gingivalis, and talk to us about some really practical things that we can do, all of us, not just those of us with skin problems, but also our loved ones, our friends, our family, those who could also make strategic choices to help reduce this possible inflammatory trigger that is lurking in the oral microbiome. And given how popular the other oral microbiome shows have been here on the Healthy Skin Show, I figured this would be just as helpful. If you'd like to check out the resources and all of the links that I've set aside for you in conjunction with this episode, head on over to skinterrupt.com forward slash 293. There you can also leave your questions and comments so we can keep the conversation going. And because this is a more universal topic, make a point to share this episode with those you know who 
really need to pay attention to their oral health and maybe are already experiencing some inflammatory health conditions, perhaps making some simple strategic changes could benefit them by bringing down that inflammatory load lurking under the surface. And if you found this episode helpful, make a point to rate and review The Healthy Skin Show, then hit that subscribe button so you never miss a weekly dose of all of the research, strategies, alternative tips, and even inspirational stories to help you on your journey of rebuilding healthy skin. And then let's connect over on Instagram. I'm at Jennifer Fugo. Thanks so much for tuning in, and I look forward to digging deeper with you in the next episode.